thank you so much. Uh, so let me start with. Uh, um, so um, so here is a picture of young Schumpeter, <laughs> and uh, uh, Schumpeter is known for having put forward the notion of creative destruction, uh, the process whereby new innovations displace old technologies. Uh, for example, in his book Capitalism, Social Democracy, Schumpeter try try to spell out you know, what he means by creative destruction. But in fact, when I studied growth economics in my youth, uh, there was no model of Schumpeterian growth uh, economics. The, you know, the, the leading uh, paradigm was a neoclassical paradigm, the solo model, where growth is primarily driven by capital accumulation and under reasonable assumptions of decreasing returns to capital accumulation, there can be no long run growth under capital accumulation alone. So solo would point that technical progress is required to uh, to generate long run growth. Uh, uh, but a solo would not tell you where uh, technical progress comes from. And uh, uh, but there was this guy Schumpeter who talks about innovation and creative destruction. But there was no model embodying the notion of creative destruction. And there was no empirics either. So with Peter Howitt in 1987, in the fall of 1987, we, uh, uh, from scratch, we wrote a model of growth that embodies the notion of creative destruction. And this model revolves around three main ideas. The first idea is that long-run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation. The second idea, uh, where each innovator builds upon previous innovations, we will see that later on, the importance of the cumulative nature of innovation. Second uh, uh, idea is that innovations uh, result from entrepreneurial activities motivated by the prospect of innovation runs. If I find a new product or a cheap way to produce, uh, then I get some runs, monopoly runs for a while until uh, I am superseded, until I'm imitated or whatever. And it's the prospect of those runs that you know encouraged me as an entrepreneur to invest in R and D and other type of innovative activities uh, uh, to generate innovation. Okay, and the third idea is creative destruction. New innovations displace old technologies. New innovations make old technologies obsolete. And you see, at the heart of the Schumpeterian paradigm, there is a contradiction because on the one hand, you need monopoly rents, you need the prospect of innovation rents to, to induce innovative activities. But on the other hand, yesterday's innovators are tempted to use those rents to prevent subsequent innovations and subsequent entry because they don't want themselves to be subject to creative destruction. And regulating capitalism is largely about how to manage this contradiction fact that you need rents to generate innovation. But on the other hand, these rents will be used, exposed by yesterday's innovators to prevent future innovation. So now, why this Schumpeterian paradigm changed the landscape? It changed the landscape first because it gives center stage to cross-firm heterogeneity between incumbents and entrants, between leaders and followers, between small firms and large firms. So that's new. In previous growth models, there were no sense the notion of entry and incumbents, leader, followers, small and large. Uh, this is the first model where it is at the heart of the model, okay? And this paradigm also gives center stage to firm dynamics. For example, typically, if you take, if we follow Clete and Kortub, which is a Schumpeterian model in 2004, uh, you can think of a firm, here it's a firm with four lines. How do you expand? Because you do creative destruction on another line. For example, firm F innovates upon uh, the current line of someone else, and then firm F goes from being a four line to a five line. How firm F shrinks is because someone else will innovate upon one of firm F's current lines, and then firm F in that case shrinks from being a four line firm to a three line firm. And uh, so that's a model that accommodates and you know expansion of firms, uh, 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 contraction of firms, entry. You are nobody, you innovate upon somebody, you enter. You exit because you have one line and someone innovates upon you and you exit. So you can, you can, you see, you have firm size, firm dynamics, very naturally 
in a Schumpeterian framework. Okay, and uh, uh, the, now this uh, framework generates various predictions. Let me stress two distinctive predictions. A first prediction is that growth is positively correlated with firm turnover, and the second one is more intense competition enhances comp innovation in frontier firms for leaders, but discourages in non-frontier firms for what I call followers. So the first one, you can, have, you know, you can do cross-country or cross-region, and you can put on the horizontal axis a measure of creative destruction. It could be the uh, job turnover, the Davis Alti Wonger type of measure of job turnover. It can be firm churning, entry and exit of firms. So you put that on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, put GDP, uh, growth in per capita GDP, for example, and you will tend to find always a positive correlation between the rate of creative destruction on the horizontal axis and per capita GDP growth on the vertical axis. Okay, that's typically a prediction that other growth models would not generate. Uh, 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 another one, and uh, so let me just move on. Uh, um, another prediction is more intense competition enhances innovation in frontier firms, but discourages in non-frontier firms. So uh, uh, typically, you know, I always tell my students, imagine that you are a classroom. Some of you are better than others. You have the top of the class and the bottom of the class. You open the door and you let in a brilliant student. What will happen? The top of the class will work harder to remain the top of the class, but the bottom of the class, which is already discouraged, will be even more discouraged when I open the door and let a good student in. It's exactly the same for firms. Here, this is drawn from work with Blondell, uh, Griffith, uh, 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 Prantel, and Howey. And uh, uh, we, we, uh, the blue line is based on UK data, but you could reproduce that in many, very pretty much every country. Uh, the blue line is the frontier firms. And uh, uh, on the horizontal axis, I have a measure of product market competition, for example, the learner index. And on the vertical, I would have the growth rate of firms or the innovation rate of firms, whatever. And what you see is that the frontier firms, they react positively indeed to competition. They innovate more, they grow more. But the uh, orange firms are the firms far below the, the frontier in the sector, and they react negatively to competition. Okay, so that's something to keep it to bear in mind when uh, for what I will tell later. Okay, so this is an introduction. But I'm supposed here now to talk about innovation, growth, and climate. So, uh, you know, in France, we've been very much, and I think it's true in other countries, uh, uh, having to uh, uh, having to to argue with uh, advocates of degrowth. So, you know, the way, for, according to them, to uh, uh, the way to fight climate change and uh, uh, is to uh, to go for negative growth. Okay, and I will argue against that. Uh, um, but in fact, before I argue against them, I want to give them some credit. It's true that if you look at history, temperature, here I show the long-run evolution of temperature, okay? And you see that temperature remains essentially constant, and then it starts rising sharply, worldwide temperature, uh, in the mid-19th century, exactly at the time you have the takeoff of growth. If I draw the famous, the well-known Madison curve, that draws the evolution of per capita GDP worldwide, you would find pretty much the same shape of curve, very much flat until early 19th century, and then uh, in growth with the Industrial Revolution. And uh, it's exactly the same. And had uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution not occurred, on the right-hand side, you would have the counterfactual, where temperature would have remained constant. So it's true that historically, uh, uh, the global warming has everything to do with growth, everything. And, and uh, it's also true more recently. If you look at the CO2 emissions of China in yellow, uh, yellow orange, and, and India in blue, you see that there is a, a, you know, a takeoff in uh, CO2 emissions of these two countries precisely at the time where growth took off in these two countries. Okay, So that's true. Now, does it mean that you want to uh, have negative growth and go back to pre-1820? No, because growth has given us a lot. Life expectancy has gone up. Uh, uh, we also we in, in better health. We also work is less harmful. Uh, there is less hardship at work because 
a lot of, you know, uh, uh, hard tasks are being automated. And so now, you know, uh, uh, work as much and we don't work to need as hard in terms of physical pain, you know, uh, involved in, in work. I mean, there is less of that. Uh, uh, and th that's all that is thanks to growth and innovation. Uh, uh, so we don't want to go back. And also, uh, we had an experience of negative growth. It was with the first lockdown. You know, before we had the uh, COVID vaccine, uh, uh, we had in France, for example, but that was true everywhere, between March 2020 and uh, May, June 2020, we had degrowth. In France, for example, GDP went down by 35% between March and May, June. And CO2 emissions went down by 8%. So the IPCC tells you that if you want to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to fight climate change efficiently, you should have a CO2 emission uh, averaging at 8% per year. Uh, that means that we should be permanently in the first lockdown. Uh, uh, but that's, we don't want to do that because we know that the first lockdown, we had to do it. We had no vaccine at the time, but it had, you know, it harmed the youth in particular. It was, uh, it was a painful experience. Uh, we had no choice in such conditions uh, uh, permanently. So the alternative to uh, negative growth is have, uh, to have green innovation. So now I want now to talk about implications of introducing endogenous and directed innovations aimed at green technologies. And I want to look at how introducing endogenous and directed green innovation uh, affects the climate debate. <laughs> now, the first remark is that uh, uh, y y firms do not spontaneously innovate in green technologies. In fact, in work that I've done with Van Rinen, uh, uh, David Emus, uh, Antoine de Chez Le Prêtre, uh, and, and John Van Rinen, we and uh, Ralph Martin in the JPE 2016, we looked at the automotive industry and we looked at the incentive of uh, automotive firms to innovate green or not. So we used patent data. We had access to World Patent Statistical Database, PATSTAT, and we focused on patents which were at the European Patent Office over the period 1978-2005. And we looked at patents filed in 80 patent offices in the world, okay? But that were also uh, uh, regist you know, um, registered at the European Patent Office. So we focused, in fact, in our triadic patents. So triadic patents are patents that are registered not only in the European Patent Office, but also in the US Patent Office, the USPTO, and also the Japanese Patent Office. So those are the good patents. So see. And from these, uh, and we focus on automotive industry, but all uh, triadic patents filed in 80 patent offices worldwide, and we extracted all patents pertaining to clean and those pertaining to dirty in automotive industry, okay, following the OECD IPC definition. And also, one is, what's interesting is that you, for each patent applicant, you know the past history of their patenting. They, you know whether they patented green or dirty innovations in the past. So here is the classification of uh, the type of innovation in automotive. So uh, when you are at the top, it's very much relative to electric vehicles. And the more you move down this uh, slide, the more you go into combustion engines. So you could say that the, the you know, innovations that uh, pertain to the categories at the top of the slide are cleaner innovations, whereas innovations that pertain to uh, uh, the, the uh, rows at the bottom of this slide are more like dirty innovations, okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, because there are more into combustion engines uh, vehicles, okay? So now what we did is to say, well, you know what we will do? We take a firm I at, in a certain year T, and we look at the flow of clean patents by that firm in that year. And it depends, for example, first on the uh, it depends first on the FPIT, the fuel price that this firm faces. Alors, how you calculate the fuel price faced by a firm that sells in various places worldwide, where it's a weighted average of of the various countries that firms uh, sells to, with weights equal to the exposures 
of that firm to in these countries, okay? And there you construct a firm level uh, uh, measure of fuel price exposure, that uh, FPIT that you have here, okay? And then you have other measures. That what we were particularly interested was this KD and the KC. The KD is the stock of past dirty patents by that firm, by Time T. And KD is the stock of clean patents by that firm at Time T. And what we find, we find first that, of course, if you increase, a, if a firm faces a higher fuel price, the firm is more likely to innovate clean and less likely to innovate dirty. So that's reconforting that, of course, a, a, a carbon tax, for example, anything that increases the fuel price will, of course, tend to redirect innovation towards clean technologies because it becomes less profitable in a market that will shrink due to the increase in fuel price. Okay? But what's more interesting is to look at the stock, the effect of the stock of clean and dirty. You can see in that row on the left that having a stock, a higher stock of dirt, of clean, uh, makes you uh, uh, innovate clean more. That's the uh, 0.303 with three stars. Okay, so you have a significant and important effect of your past stock of clean uh, into your current flow of clean. Okay, and. Uh, um, now, if you go into the stock of dirty, it's true that you have a, some positive spillovers between past dirty innovation and current flow of clean. But you can see that that's the 0 0.139. But you see that the effect of the stock of dirty is much bigger on the current flow of dirty. That's the 0 0.542. So if I was doing looking at the first column minus the second column, which would be the, the propensity to innovate clean rather than dirty, you can see then that higher stock of clean increases my propensity to innovate clean rather than dirty, whereas a higher stock of dirty increases my propensity to innovate dirty more than clean, you see? And that's the path dependence. And why is that a prob problem? Because it implies that if you start from a situation where firms innovated mainly in dirty technologies and there is less effect, then spontaneously, firms will continue innovating in dirty technologies. And therefore, the economy as a result may get stuck with dirty technologies and may fall into uh, uh, environmental disaster. So the problem is that green innovation does not occur spontaneously. Firms spontaneously tend to keep the bad habits. If they innovated dirty in the past, they tend to innovate dirty in the future. The good news is that government can avoid disaster by redirecting innovation towards clean technologies. And I, that's the, we saw that already with the fuel price. The fuel price is one instrument whereby you can redirect uh, uh, in a firm's innovation towards clean innovation. Okay, so now I would like to look at further implications of having this endogenous uh, directed innovation by firms, okay? And so uh, I can continue. Can you hear me well? Is that okay? Can you hear me? Okay, very good. So, uh, uh, so further implications. First is that creative destruction will help you. Why? Because uh, uh, we know that there is this path dependence. But who faces path dependence? Not the firms that just entered. The new entrants, they don't have the problem of bad habits. So if any policy that would favor nowadays creative destruction, that means more entry of new firms, helps you because those firms are less prone to innovate dirty, they will right away go into clean technologies because they don't have to pay a transition cost from dirty to clean. They start in itself. It's good to uh, uh, foster green innovation. I will get back to this point later on when I talk about finance. Okay, so that's the first implication of having endogenous directed. Uh, Another one is that you should act now. There has been a big debate. Uh, there has been a big debate between, you know, Nordhaus and Nick Stern. Uh, Nordhaus thought that we should not uh, put carbon tax too high right away because it would impose a high cost on current generations. But because Nordhaus uh, had would give uh, had a discount rate which was higher, that means that Nordhaus would give more weight to the. Whereas Nick Stern would have a discount rate that
that gives more weight to the future generations, and therefore Nick Stern would advocate acting right away. But this, this debate between Nick Stern and Nordhaus, uh, the, the, the Nick Stern report and Nordhaus DICE model, was done entirely in a model of growth with capital accumulation. There was no innovation there. Innovation played no role in these models, okay? Now, what happens if you introduce endogenous directives? Well, a uh, first, uh, first uh, conclusion is that even with the Nordhaus discount rate, you want to act right away. Why is that? Because without immediate intervention, innovation will spontaneously be directed by firms towards dirty technologies. Therefore, the gap between the clean and the dirty technology will widen. Already, you are better at the dirty than at the clean technology. Of course, because you innovate essentially in the dirty and not at the clean. The gap between the dirty and the clean will widen. And the cost inter of intervention, which is reduced growth as long as clean technologies catch up with dirty, that's the cost of forcing firms to move from what they do very well, which is dirty technology, to uh, clean technologies. That's costly because you force someone to do to move from something he was she was doing very well to something she's not doing so well. Uh, uh, that of course, if you if you delay intervention, the gap between the dirty can be wide enough. That means that when you will have to intervene tomorrow, it will have to be a deeper and longer intervention. So you will have a deeper and pro more prolonged period of reduced growth. And uh, 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 that's why even with the Nordhaus discount rate, you want to act right away. It's like the dentist. If you wait, you have a cavity and you wait to go to the dentist, the cavity will deepen and you will need more drilling with the dentist for to, to cure the cavity. It's the same here. Okay, and we see here that based on my work with uh, Asemoglu, uh, Emus, and uh, Verstein, and we see that uh, you know uh, the, uh, the the one percent is the nor is the next term discount rate. Of course, if you delay uh, intervention, the loss of welfare, and I express the loss of welfare in per year consumption equivalent, uh, you have substantial loss of welfare in consumption equivalent. But even if you uh, with a discount rate of 1.5%, which is a Nordhaus discount rate. So simplification, uh, the first one is creative destruction is good. The second one is act now, even with the Nordhaus discount rate. You can see here, by the way, you see the, the green curve is the evolution of uh, uh, per capita GDP. And you see the per capita GDP grows. But of course, if you delay, you will have a higher level. Uh, it will be the red curve. You have a higher level of per capita GDP because, in fact, you <laughs> you let firms do what they do very well for grow faster. But you see, eventually, the red curve falls below below the green curve. So you you want to act right away, okay? Because with the red strategy, you waited, and therefore you need to uh, uh, you know have a more prolonged and deeper period of reduced growth. Okay, another implication of endogenous directed innovation is that you want two instruments, not only one. Why? Because you have at least two externalities. You have the environmental externality, you know, I pollute, but you also have the path dependence externality, the knowledge externality that I just spelled out. Uh, uh, so because you have knowledge externality and environmental externality, we, we know in public economics that when you have two externalities, you need at least two instruments. And here it means that you need on, not only carbon tax, but also green other instruments. So the other thing is what I would call green industrial policy, IRA, for example, in the US, or I call that subsidies to green innovation. But you need both. You need the two legs, the carbon tax and the green subsidies and more generally the green industrial policy. OK, so that's the second thing. And here I look at what would happen if you only rely on carbon tax. Well, if you only rely on carbon tax to uh, fight uh, climate change, you need a much higher carbon tax. And of course, it will hurt particularly current generation. And I show you the loss of welfare in purpose of using only the carbon tax, which would mean that you would need a 15 times higher carbon tax during the first five years and uh, 12 times higher carbon tax during the following five years. Well, overall, that's the loss of welfare that it would entail, respectively, with the 1% discount rate of Nick Stern and 1.5% discount rate of Nordhaus. OK, so that's another. Alors, reinforcing the case for green subsidies, what I want to do here is I want to talk 
I, want, I will complicate a bit the framework and I will introduce an intermediate source of energy. Think of shell gas, but it could be nuclear fission in France. And the question is when you, uh, how should design, how should you design the energy transition strategy? How should you deal with the intermediate source of energy? So the intermediate source is less polluting than coal, but it's more polluting than uh, the renewable energy or other source that you want to have in the long run. Okay, how do you deal with this intermediate source of energy? Okay, so that's very much based on work that I did with Asemoglu, Barrage, and Emus. Okay, and uh, in fact, what you can see in the U.S. This is the fraction of fuel. The red curve is the share of fuel in electricity generation that comes from coal. And the blue curve is the share of fuel in electricity generation that comes from natural gas. And you see that uh, uh, natural gas became increasingly important and coal became increasingly less important in the U.S. with an acceleration of this in around 2008, 2010. Okay. Now, uh, what, we, what we can do is to analyze Suppose that there is an exogenous improvement uh, in extraction technology. For example, you have the shale gas revolution in the US, okay? And that's what we could call a shale gas boom. What would be the effect on aggregate pollution in the short run and the long run? So the short run effect is that absent innovation, so in the short run, you abstract from the effect of the shale gas boom on the direction of innovation. There are two opposite effects of the shale gas boom. On the one hand, you substitute gas for coal, that will reduce CO2 emissions. But on the other hand, when you have the shell gas boom uh, revolution, you, you have, uh, energy as a whole becomes cheaper. And because energy becomes cheaper, uh, uh, consumption of energy will increase. And that's what I call the scale effect. It turns out that the substitution effect, of course, will dominate if the gas is sufficiently cleaner than coal. Okay? Uh, that's obvious, in fact. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, what's interesting is that we calibrated our model and our calibration very much matches the, the reality. We, we look at uh, various uh, scenarios of increase in the technology for extracting uh, natural gas in the US, okay? And uh, you see first that, of course, when you increase uh, the B, the BS0 is the productivity in extraction of gas. When it goes up, you see that the per unit of electricity produced there is, of course, you lower emission intensity of CO2. But on the other hand, energy consumption, that's the substitution effect. That's the first column. The second column is that, of course, because you have the scale effect, because energy, because energy becomes cheaper, uh, energy consumption will go up. That's the, this column. But uh, overall, what's interesting is that uh, the combination of the two is that overall, CO2 emissions still go down in the short run. And uh, that's the third column. Okay, even though the consumption goes up because the uh, reduction in intensity is so big that it more than counteracts the increase in consumption. The substitution effect more than counteracts the scale effect. And we see that, you know, that's the US. So if you look at CO2 intensity, uh, 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 it was essentially constant up to the shell gas revolution and intensity falls down quickly. Now, if you look at emission, they were increasing up to the shell gas revolution, but since the shell gas revolution, at least in the short run, uh, 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 CO2 emissions also have gone down. So in the short run, the shale gas revolution has been a good thing in the US with regard to CO2 emission. But now there is a long-term problem. And the long-term problem now, now we reintroduce endogenous directed innovation. Okay? On, and uh, we look that, alors, the idea is that you can have innovations on power plants that use uh, coal. You can have innovations on power plants that use gas. And you can have green innovation. And, uh, uh, and they're all endogenous, of course. It's firms that decide upon them. Now, what will happen is that the shell gas boom, in fact, will have, it will direct innovation away from both uh, uh, coal and clean production technologies into gas production technologies. You will direct innovation away from uh, innovating on plants that, uh, that process coal, but you will also direct uh, a re a research resources away from green uh, innovation. Okay, all that for innovating on plants that process gas. And, uh, uh, and the problem with that is that yeah, therefore the shale gas boom uh, may move the economy from a path where prior to the, move, the, the, the shale gas boom, you had declining CO2 emissions in the long run into a path where you end up increasing CO2 emissions. And in fact, exactly what's happening. We see first that the ratio of green to total patents in the US but elsewhere has gone down 
since 2010. That's not a proof. But uh, what's more important is this. I look here at the effects of the shell gas boom. And here we look, here we, it is. I look at the, uh, on a non-managed uh, uh, increase in, shell, in uh, shell gas revolution. Okay, so I look, I suppose that I just have a, a shell gas and no policy from the government except to allow for the shell gas. What happens? The share of scientists into green technologies on the left falls when you have the boom. You see, in gray, it was the, the evolution of the share of scientists into green without the boom and with the boom, it goes down. Okay. Now, the emissions, they initially go down, and that's a short run. But the short run is very short run. And you see that uh, it, both the emissions uh, and the energy consumption, you see what I mean? So the, 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 the emission will go down, but then, then uh, uh, they will go up again, and they go up in the long run. And very quickly, they start going up. This represents 20, 20 years. So there is a, a 20 years period where uh, uh, the short run effects uh, are dominate, but quickly the long run effect which is to divert resources away from green, will lead to increased emissions. And because emissions go up, output net of damages will go down. You see, and that's the right-hand side figure. So you see that this long-term effect is very important. If you have a non-managed uh, 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 shell gas boom, you, uh, you, go, you, may, you move from a good uh, trajectory to a bad trajectory. Okay, so now what is the optimal policy? Well, here is the optimal policy with and without the boom. Without the boom, you would have this share of scientists in green. Now that you have the boom, you need to compensate for the boom by being even much more, uh, uh, much more voluntary and uh, 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 to put more scientists in green. And you see, that's uh, the optimum under the so the the the, the laissez faire is there, and, and the optimum under the boom is that you want to go much higher. You see, no, the laissez faire was doing this, and you want to go much more. And here I compare. Uh, the optimal green research technology with and without the boom here. And you can see that when you have the boom, you want to increase a lot green research subsidies because to counteract this, uh, uh, you know, uh, tendency for researchers to divert their effort of the intermediate source, to compensate for that, you need to, uh, uh, to reinforce the subsidies to green research. And that's why green research is important. The carbon tax doesn't change much, but you see that the subsidies to green research go up a lot. You see, that's uh, with boom, it's here. Without boom, it was here. So it's way above with boom than without boom. You see? So therefore, the idea is that a non-managed shell gas boom can be very dangerous because it can derail the transition away from a virtual transition towards green technologies. But if you manage it, if together with the boom, you reinforce the subsidies to green innovation, get the best of both worlds. That means you can get the, the good aspect of the shell gas boom, which is a reduction in CO2 emissions in the short run, but at the same time, without uh, impairing, without, uh, 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 you know, without uh, move, going against the long-term future, without uh, compromettre the long-term future. Okay, so that's what I wanted to make. So my, my, so my conclusion so far, when you have endogenous direct innovation, creative destruction is important. You want to act now, even with the Nordhaus discount rate. You want two instruments, carbon tax and subsidy to green innovation, even more when you have an intermediate source of energy. That's where I am for the moment. I, the last important conclusion is that the civil society, not only the state, civil society has also a role to play, okay? And, uh, uh, and so here, uh, 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 and uh, I would like to tell you about consumers and social values. Okay, so that's based on work I did with Roland Benabou, Ralph Martin, Alexandra Roulet, which is published now in AR Insight, okay? And what we do there is that we, we look at, at uh, how consumers, at the, the, value, the effect on firms' innovation of consumer valuation for the environment. You know, through the world, uh, uh, the world survey, uh, you can get information on consumers' willingness to to uh, be taxed for green or consumers motivation for green. Uh, uh, and that's the world value survey. Okay. And you know that for various countries. And what you can show is that first in firms innovate green to cater to their consumers demand for green. And that's the, again, I, I go back to the automotive industry, except that now we don't stop at 2005. We go all the way to 2019. 
and I look at the propensity to innovate clean rather than dirty, that's my left-hand side variable, and values, the first row, is the extent to which a firm is exposed to countries where consumers value the environment. So how you construct that at firm level? Exactly as I did before for the fuel price, I sell in Germany and in the US, two-thirds in the US, one-third in Germany. Well, my exposure to values is two-thirds US plus one-third Germany values. You see what I mean? And that's how I construct a firm level value valuation for a green. And you see, when you are confronted with consumers on average that are more concerned by the environment, you innovate more clean than dirty. That's the first rule. But now there is another effect. It's competition. If you introduce more competition, it has two effects. Competition, of course, will lower prices. And because it lower prices, uh, people will consume more and produce more. And that, of course, has a, a scale effect whereby you increase emission. So competition has a bad static effect because it makes the product cheaper. There is more demand for the product, and therefore you produce more. I could call that the Chinese effect. When China expands and poverty goes down in China, which is a very good thing, pollution goes up at the same time. Okay, But there is another effect on competition, which is a virtuous effect. And the virtuous effect is the innovation effect. If consumers value the environment, then more competition induces more green innovation. The, the story is as follows. Luis is virtuous, and I'm not virtuous. And we are in an environment where consumers value the environment, okay? And uh, in an economy where consumers value the environment. First case, Luis is not there. I'm on my own. Okay, I want to cater to my consumer, but not crazy, uh, because anyway, I'm the, I'm the monopolist. So I know that consumers have no choice but purchasing from me. I may still have some incentive to innovate with, but I won't have huge incentive to innovate with. Now, Luis comes in, and Luis is virtuous. Luis wants to innovate green. Then, even if I am not virtuous, I will innovate green to escape competition with Luis. You see, remember the escape competition effect, you know, that the, 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 uh, the blue firms you know, react positively to competition by innovating more because they innovate to escape competition with a new entrant, very, very good student. Here, in that case, more competition with the competition with Luis, even if I am not virtuous, induces me to innovate greener because that's the way to escape competition with Luis. And now, when you look back at the table, you look at the third row, the third row shows the uh, interaction between competition and values. So uh, you see that this interaction is always positive. So, uh, the, uh, so first, so to, together is that when you face as a firm uh, companies that are more where consumers value the environment that you want to innovate greener, that's the first rule. But all the more when there is more competition, and that's the third rule. You see, all the more when you face more competition on average, and uh, that's very interesting because you can see that uh, the carbon tax is an instrument. But the combination of educating consumers and product market competition together, this is as important as a huge increase in carbon price. And you know, in France, we had the Yellow Vest movement in 2018. But just to know that you have other uh, instruments besides the carbon tax, which is very important, but it's not the only one. We have the industrial policy, but we also have the combination between values, which you can uh, modify by education and competition. This, this pair values and competition is a very big uh, driver of green innovation. Now, let me conclude. First conclusion is that innovation-based model of climate suggests that laissez-faire leads to disaster, to the fast dependence in the direction of innovation. Second conclusion is that one must act now and multiple instruments might be used, not just the carbon tax. Third conclusion, there is, firms, uh, there is this triangle between firms, the state and civil society. Firms innovate, so we need them, but they don't spontaneously innovate in clean technologies. We need the state to redirect firms' innovation towards clean technologies, carbon tax, industrial policy, green, it's a competition policy. But the civil society, as we just saw, has also a role to play. Consumers also are there to discipline uh, uh, firms. And civil society is not just consumers, it's the media to denounce scandals, uh, 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 unions, uh, associations, all that is very important. You see, that's, the, that's my first one. The second one, I, conclusion, is that there is a role, as I said, for green industrial policy. Now, you could say maybe just a role for green subsidies. 
But in current work with David Emus and Ernest Liu from Princeton, we look at the transition to green technology, to a green uh, economy along the value chain. So you have a chain of input-output, a bit like in Fari Bakae type of models, where you have a chain of uh, each you know, level is an input to the, follow, to the more downstream. So the most upstream is the most uh, input, <laughs> and you go down and you go more downstream, okay? So now, uh, complementarities, you have therefore complementarities across multiple layers, and that complementarity typically leads to multiple equilibria where with either clean technologies uh, are adopted or they are not adopted. And, uh, and there, there is a role of industrial policy to coordinate all sectors towards moving to electrification, for example. With the Puigouvian tax alone, you will not remove the multiplicity of equilibria. And uh, if you have only subsidy, uniform subsidy, it would have to be a huge subsidy, which would be very costly. And so you want sector-specific subsidies and a, sequ a, a sequence of sector-specific subsidies, and that's what you call uh, industrial policy. And in a model like that, uh, you can't uh, do without uh, 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 truly industrial policy, okay? Uh, uh, there is also, the, uh, I would like to say something about the role of finance. That's in current work with Bergeau, De Reader, and Van Rinen. And uh, I will just show you uh, uh, the effect of the exposure. Uh, we look at the role of finance. Some people talk about green finance, but I just want to say that finance is good. The bottom line I want to tell you is that finance is particularly helpful to finance new firms. I told you before that uh, uh, an implication of the endogenous directed innovation is that creative destruction is very important. You want to favor the entry of new firms that do not face the path dependence problem as much as older firms do. So how you do that? Uh, uh, so that the idea is that finance, anything that will ease the entry of new firms uh, uh, will, will help. So for example, here we look at the exposure of the German banking crisis, the effect it had on green innovation. So, in fact, you had some firms in Germany that were exposed to Commerce Bank in their lending, in their borrowed a lot from Commerce Bank, and, and other firms that were identical, but they were not exposed to Commerce Bank. And what happened is that during the crisis, Commerce Bank had to cut lending after losses to international trading portfolios. So then I do a difference in difference. I look before versus after the crisis, and at firms that relied on Commerce Bank lending versus identical firms that did not rely on commerce bank lending, okay? And here is what you have. On overall patenting, being a, a commerce bank firm versus a treated firm, which is a commerce bank firm, versus a control firm, which is a non-commerce bank firm, makes no difference. But on the right-hand side, you can see that it makes a difference on green patenting. So following the commerce bank crisis, uh, green patents goes down for, uh, for firms that are exposed to commerce bank. That's the first thing. Second thing, it's particularly true for young firms, and in fact, it's the most true for young and small firms. So what's very interesting is that those who suffer the most, you know, uh, are the young and small. And we know that it's the young and small that carry the energy transition because they're the most prone to innovate green, but provided they can afford it, provided they can finance the green innovation. And the problem is that when you have a credit crunch, you are particularly harming the, green, the small and young, which were the, the leaders, they are supposed to be the leaders of the green transition. And therefore, whenever you have a credit crunch, you slow down the transition to green innovation. So that's very important because it also has implication for macro policy. If you raise interest rate too much, you will, uh, of course, particularly hurt the financing of small and and therefore you will slow down the uh, transition to uh, low carbon economy. The important thing, that's on the monetary policy side. On the budgetary policy side, I would like just to draw your attention on how you manage public debt. You might say, I want to reduce my public debt, therefore I renounce uh, uh, getting involved in any kind of investment, of public investment, including investment in green technologies, uh, uh, including any kind of green subsidies to public subsidies to green innovation. But if you do that, the problem is that we know that firms spontaneously will continue to innovate dirty because of the path dependence, and therefore it will be much more costly to, uh, for the state to intervene uh, tomorrow. So it means that when you deal, usually when you think of public debt, we think of current versus future generations. You don't want to leave high level of public debt to the future generation. But you have to look at the two, two debts, 
you have the true public debt, and you have the environmental debt. You don't leave more public debt tomorrow to leave a much higher environmental debt tomorrow. You have to arbitrage these two debts. And so that's, uh, that's factoring in. So you see, so the first point on interest rate means that you need to factor in green transition into monetary policy design. And the second is that you have to factor in green transition into budgetary policy and management of public debt uh, policy, you see? Uh, finally, I would like my last slide is that there are different types of innovation. Well, you know, there are innovations that mitigate the okay? They are called mitigation innovations. So for example, uh, discovering new sources of energy, uh, producing with less energy, all those are great innovations, but they tend to slow down the rise in temperature, okay? So there are innovation of mitigation. But then you have what we call innovation of adaptation. <laughs> for example, dikes <laughs> or air conditioning are innovations that help you adapt to the global warming. And then you also have now innovation of amelioration innovation that uh, cool down the uh, cold, ma make the air colder. And now you said that's very much experimental, but I have to mention that to you. Uh, in Harvard's physics department, you have what we call geoengineering. Researchers, physicists work on a technology of geoengineering to lower uh, the temperature. And how you do that? Well, you, you take note of the fact that whenever you have a volcanic eruption, uh, then the air cools down. Why? Because the, the sulfur particles uh, uh, in the air make screen out, you see, the sun. You see what I mean? It, uh, it, uh, it, and that's why it uh, cools down the atmosphere. The idea is to see, well, can, we dom can we dominate this technology? Can we, can we master uh, 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 this technology in order to, uh, uh, can we harness this technology in order to, uh, uh, in order to, to lead to uh, cooling down the air? There is another technology, which is uh, the shades, the space shades. Uh, uh, you put some kind of big shades in space, and that's what. Of course, those are still very uh, you know, experimental, and uh, uh, I can call that plan B innovation. And now, I just want to make one remark on that. Whenever, sometimes when I mention those, People tell me, no, that's very bad, because those are, let's call them plan B innovations. <clears throat> we need to do plan A first. And if you mention plan B, you will discourage A innovation. And that is kind of very bad moral. But I don't feel the same way, because I believe that it's not the same country that will implement A plan B. Plan B, I can well imagine China or India down the road. Don't do that for plan A that temperature will become so unbearable, people will die, so many people will die, that in China who, can, who are very much exposed to global warming and still can be innovation, will unilaterally implement Plan B. And, uh, and so anticipating that, we should do more Plan A. So I think the possibility of Plan B will encourage, should encourage us to do more Plan A today. So I, I, I turn the moral hazard argument back on its feet. You see what I mean? I think that it's not the same countries that will pursue the plan A innovation and the plan B. Anticipating that if we don't do enough plan A, India, China will implement plan B innovation should induce us to do more plan A innovation today. Okay, so that's what I, I think I'm done there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Aguion. We have time for questions. So I'm going to ask yes. you to raise your hand uh, in order to make questions. Elias, the first question. And we're going to take, if it's OK for you, if we take two questions and then we'll continue? Yeah. OK, yes. let's yes, do that way. Perfect. Elias. Hi, uh, Professor Aguion. First, uh, let me thank you for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, Thank you. Which I would uh, characterize as uh, uh, getting uh, many angles right about what is the optimal policy or optimal set of policies when you yeah. have uh, endogenous uh, uh, growth, innovation, interactions with the consumer values and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and, other, and other elements. Um, but the, the, I think that the issue we, we face is that 
many of these optimal policies are very, you know, they, 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 they hit a wall of uh, the political economy realities. So I wanted to push you a little bit on that direction. So in, in particular, you touch on, on two on two issues. Uh, first is the I like your 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 your, your first uh, discussion on having two instruments for two externalities. So ta not only taxes but also subsidies. Uh, yeah. But we know that of those two, there is one that is much more likely to pass through Congress, which are the subsidies, right? <laughs> That's basically what the U.S. Yeah. has done and other yeah. countries. Uh, and uh, the tax part is, the, you know, not, not so lucky. And therefore, we, we are naturally facing an uh, imbalance of uh, potentially very large proportions in uh, government budgets. Uh, another example of the political economy uh, involved in your analysis is what you, uh, I think, touch upon towards the end on consumer values. Um, I mean, I think this, this uh, is uh, of enormous uh, value to understand that it has, has, uh, has a significant effect on, uh, on competition, on innovation. But I am very surprised to, you know, go to a supermarket and try to figure out what is the carbon footprint or more generally the environmental footprint of anything that I want to buy. And there is just no information about this. So I wonder if the, that's the case because it's, it, it's too hard to come to a measure or there's a political pressure from groups, from, from firms that they don't want to, you know, get, be exposed because they have a very high carbon footprint. So in other words, how would you, what are your thoughts on how to overcome the political economy uh, barrier, barriers that are basically preventing policies to be implemented in the optimal way that you so eloquently describe? Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for this question. Very well. Uh, to do justice to it, uh, we we'll take a, a long, long answer. Uh, uh, I think you're right. I mean, we face the political problem uh, in France with the Yellow Vest movement very sharply. So I, that's why I believe that you need a combination of policies. You, we, for example, typically, if you combine carbon tax with uh, industrial, uh, smart industrial policy, green, you can have a much lower carbon tax. You don't need to have it as, as high. So I think that you can increase carbon tax. You can do it also in a way which doesn't hurt some categories like the poorest or those who are. In France, for example, the carbon tax was very badly received because there are many people who we live in suburbs with production to the center. You see what I mean? And, uh, uh, and therefore, when you, uh, they had no alternative but use the, the uh, gas oil cars. And, uh, uh, and therefore, when, uh, uh, when, the, when, when the government decided to increase a lot the carbon tax, these guys were trapped because they said, God, we have no alternative. Have you had investments to build uh, 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 S-Ban systems, you know, kind of uh, suburban uh, trains and all you have been here to increase uh, the rise of tax, the carbon tax? So that's why the two policies are complementary. You see what I mean? It, it helps a lot. In Switzerland, there is no problem with the carbon tax because you have trams everywhere. Uh, in Germany, you have a very good S-band system. So, uh, uh, not in France. So th that's why you need both sides. You see, it, uh, it's a very important. Uh, uh, now, you, you raise also another problem, another thing with, uh, you know, that how you know uh, that that good the composition. Uh, that's that, that's why you have some organism like, for example, B Corp. B Corp gives a, a grade to a firm. So what you could look just is to have a, a grade with B Corp. So what is the big upgrade? Like you have, for example, alcohol. Now, when you buy goods, you know the, you know, you know, or whatever, or the nicotine. Well, you know when you buy cigarettes, how much nicotine there is, or how much, uh, or, or grease. Uh, you know, we, we know how uh, fat there is. You know, we know that now. You buy your product you know, on the, um, you know, on the um, emballage, on the, whatever, uh, 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 you you have the the the, the fat flex, you see what I mean? The, you could imagine a, a big corp because it's CO two tech. You see what I mean? And uh, you have now some some organizations, some some companies that are in charge of doing this kind of thing. So we could imagine improvement there to 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 compute the the, the big corp. Alors, the difficulty is to of course have the complete to look at input output matrix of a firm and say well that's your big corp. But and of course one issue could. Being you could lobby, grade, 
but uh, that's where you know of course anything can be uh, any policy can be uh, perverted uh, when you have lobbies but still you 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 need those policies so i think there are ways to move ahead i think there are ways forward Um, hi, Philippe, uh, Jim Stock. That was really terrific. I really enjoyed that. And we, I think that it's wonderful that you've been carrying the flag for um, uh, R&D policy, innovation policy, and it's proven to be incredibly important. You know, I do worry a little bit, and, and I'd love to have you uh, hear your thoughts about uh, green industrial policy. The moment you say green industrial policy, it just opens the floodgates for different possibilities. Some of them surely are much more effective and efficient in terms of uh, innovation, driving innovation in green uh, than others. And I wonder if you could say a little bit that would get uh, more granular in terms of what is actually effective. Yeah. I and mean, if we think about the IRA, or if we think about European policies, like the green hydrogen policy of the IRA has a hydrogen, it has fuels tax credits, it has a whole bunch of stuff, has battery incentives. Um, you know, where, where is it that you know, the research suggests that we're going to have the most effective policies? Yeah. No, Jim, thanks so much for your very, very kind words and uh, for your, your encouragement. And, and, uh, and, and the question is, uh, of course, very relevant. Of course, there is always a danger, Jim, with industrial policy that you may go against competition. I, I stressed in this presentation the importance of competition. You, uh, you need to have competition to, uh, to, and to innovate. It's a huge incentive to innovate green, to have competition. And of course, a danger would be that industrial policy could, could in fact get in the way of competition policy. So you need to think of the governance of industrial policy, or maybe to have uh, subsidies that are not subject to, you know, uh, that are not there to privilege uh, some incumbent firms uh, to be at the expense of potential entrants. You want to have pro-competition industrial policy. Alors, in my view, but you know much better than I do, that the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency type of governance with all, you know, and DARPA has improved over the years, uh, work by John Van Rinen and others have shown uh, positive evolutions in the, in, the, uh, in the governance of the DARPA. And, uh, uh, has for me, I had the feeling that it had the virtue of having a top-down and a bottom-up component. The top-down is that money comes from the ministry, you have team leaders, and they elicit competing projects. I thought DARPA had to do with that, some, at least some aspects of DARPA, and the BARDA, which was the equivalent of DARPA for biotech, the Biomedical Advanced Research and European Authority in the US, but you had many labs competing for, DAR, for BARDA uh, financing. And so I had the feeling that in the U.S. they found a way with the BARDA and DARPA to uh, reconcile uh, competition, industrial policy with competition to some extent. But that's, that's a, of course, that's a difficulty. And you want to have an industrial policy that is not going against entrants, that does not privilege incumbents at the expense of entrants. So you're right. It's a, there may, some, some, that's why, for example, Anne Kruger and others in the, in the 1980s were against any form of industrial policy because they thought that there was that eventually you would always end up uh, uh, on doing competition. So that's a huge debate, and uh, the whole uh, the whole challenge is to be able to design a pro-competition, pro-entry uh, uh, industrial policy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aguillon. I think we don't have more time for questions. That's what the clock said there. So let's give a new round of applause to Professor Aguillon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you Thank very you. much again for your great, Thank great you. presentation.